Nothing but, but the blood of Jesus. Love ran red, sin washed white. That's the theme that we're going to be using for our Good Friday and Easter service here at Eastside Baptist Church this, this year. Actually, we're going to use that theme all through the month, month of April. Sunday, we're going to be looking specifically at the second part of that, sin washed white. Today, we will look more closely at the first part of that, that thing, love ran red. Now, if you're even at least a bit familiar with the story of Jesus, you probably, probably already recognize the meaning of the phrase, love ran red. The love is the love of God. The love that God had for all mankind that's so beautifully expressed in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not, not perish, but have eternal life. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 expresses the meaning of the word red. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus shared the love that God his Father had for mankind and gave his life through the shedding of his own blood to redeem us from our sin and to make us right with God. That was accomplished through the cruel, painful, humiliating crucifixion of Jesus on a Roman cross. But that crucifixion, that shedding of his blood did not catch Jesus by surprise. His coming, his death, and his resurrection were planned, as the Apostle Paul describes it in Ephesians 1, 4, before the creation of the world. The Old Testament prophets foretold the death and resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus, hundreds of times over several thousand years, often using the imagery of, of a sacrificial lamb. One such prophecy is found in Isaiah chapter 53. Let me read just one verse of that, verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. John the Baptist gave evidence of that plan and of that sacrificial lamb imagery when Jesus came to him to be baptized in the Jordan River, declaring, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was said that this giving of his life didn't catch Jesus by surprise. The gospel accounts tell us that as Jesus journeyed with his disciples to Jerusalem for the final time in his earthly ministry, three times, three, not three, three times he told his disciples that he was, when he got to Jerusalem, that he would be arrested, betrayed, arrested, put to death, and resurrected. All three times, the disciples didn't get it. They just didn't understand. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus once again declared to the disciples that he would give his life, that is, shed his blood for, for them. We want to take just a moment to look more closely at that experience that we call the Last Supper, or more generally, the Lord's Supper. The occasion of the, Lord, of the Last Supper was the annual Passover celebration. The Passover, as you no doubt uh, recall, was the tenth and last plague that God used to bring about the release of the Hebrew people from slavery to the Egyptians as described in the Old Testament book of Exodus. God used the man Moses to confront the ruler of the Egyptians, Pharaoh, to demand their release. Pharaoh, in the stubbornness of his heart, refused to let them go. God inflicted ten plagues upon the Egyptians to confront Pharaoh's stubbornness and to show his superiority over the gods of the Egyptians. The final plague involved an angel of death who was to go through all the land of Egypt, killing the firstborn of every man and animal. 
The Hebrews were spared because God, through Moses, instructed them to kill and eat a one-year-old male lamb without defect and to use the blood of that lamb to mark the tops and sides of the door frames of the houses where they ate the lamb. In addition to eating the roasted lamb, the Hebrews were to eat unleavened bread, bread that had no yeast in it. They were to eat the roasted lamb and unleavened bread with their cloaks tucked in their belts, sandals on their feet, and their staffs in their hands, because their release would be sure and swift following God's infliction of death upon the Egyptians. When the death angel went through Egypt that night, he passed over the homes where the blood was on the doorpost, sparing the firstborn in those homes. But wherever there was no blood, he took the lives of the firstborn of men and animals, the firstborn of the Egyptians, from Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the prisoners who sat in the dungeon, and to the firstborn of all livestock as well. God commanded that the Hebrews were to celebrate the Passover annually from that point on, to remember that delivering work of God, to remind themselves and and to teach their children of the redeeming work of God in their lives. Over the centuries, the Passover celebration evolved into a ceremony involving roasted lamb, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and wine. That was the meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the occasion of what we call the Last Supper. Jesus used that Passover meal to, his, to tell his disciples one last time that he would be giving up his life for them and for all of mankind. He did that by, by predicting his betrayal and by predicting the disciples' denial of him in his time of need. He did that by telling them that, they would go, that he would go away, would pre- prepare a place for them, and would return again to them to take them to, to be there with him. He did that by telling them that he would send another, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who would, return, uh, who would be with them during his future physical absence. He did that by praying for them, asking God to strengthen and prepare them for their coming times of ministry and, and persecution. Most memorably, he did that by reassigning two of the elements of the Passover meal to himself, the bread and the wine. No longer would the bread represent the swift release of the Hebrews from slavery. No longer would the wine represent the blood of the lamb placed on the doorpost, securing the safety of the Hebrews from the death angel. Now the bread would represent his broken body, and the wine would represent his shed blood. These two elements became visible symbols of what Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us, for every person on the planet who has ever lived, for the salvation, the forgiveness of sin, and the new life that he gives to every person who chooses to put their faith and trust in him. Yes, love ran red and bought for us a glorious redemption, and the elements of the Lord's Supper represent that to us. Just as the Passover meal was celebrated annually to remind the Hebrews what God had done for them while slaves in Egypt, Jesus told his disciples to celebrate the Lord's Supper to remind us of what he did for us while we were slaves to sin. He did not, however, give us specific directions as to when to celebrate the Lord's Supper as annually the the, the Passover celebration had been. But he said, just whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Here at Eastside Baptist Church, we celebrate the Lord's Supper one Sunday a month to help us remember and to keep us focused on Jesus' redeeming work in our lives. We also want to take it today, this Good Friday, as we celebrate the greatness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The great thing about having... Mr. James Sanders here is that he brings such eloquent biblical insight to everything he speaks about. Um, Unfortunately, now you have to listen to me. The crucifixion. Our theme, as we've talked about tonight, is, is love ran red. And what a wonderful and powerful and impactful statement that is, love 
ran red. There's, there's cause, effect, there's action, there's so much packed into those three words that are put together. We could spend months talking about just the crucifixion. That's how impactful it is. It's the single most important event in human history. And it's so exciting to get here together with all of you and, and to celebrate that and to remember it and to reflect on the impact it has on us. The core of the crucifixion, what I want to be speaking to you about tonight, as, as James elaborated on the, the Lord's Supper and how it relates to the Passover and how Jesus re, reorganized, reprioritized elements from the Lord's Supper to apply to himself, his body and his blood. We see the same kind of relabeling. We see the same kind of transformation (laughs) happening to the concept of sacrifice. Because what the Pharisees did as they instigated the Romans to put Jesus to death it wasn't a, an execution anymore. It became a sacrifice. He took the entire concept of sacrifice and rewrote the book on it. And this, that concept of sacrifice, I believe, is something that resonates inherently in all of us. We think of great stories. We think of great movies and great books or people that we know in our lives who have done something, who have forsaken something of theirs so that it might benefit another. And there's just something inside of us that lights up. There's something inside of us that say like, yeah, I get that. I understand what that is. I get, we, we share that feeling together. And to me, that's just a thumbprint of evidence showing that We're all made to feel that way. We're all made to relate and resonate to the concept of sacrifice because God made all of us. And if anybody knows anything about sacrifice, it's the one who made us. As I was thinking tonight and praying and and over the last couple weeks about what I wanted to share with you tonight, I was thinking, well, what's an awesome example of sacrifice that I've seen in my life that I could, I could try to relate to this. And every time I thought about it and prayed about it, this one story kept coming, coming back into my mind and, and in my heart, and so I'm trying to be sensitive here and to follow how the Lord is, is leading in this way, and, and I want to share that with you tonight. And I think some of you might, might have heard this story before, but there's a, um, a person in, in my life who... I love very, very deeply. I consider him a brother. And he's actually the person who introduced me to my wife. And a long time ago, a um, couple years out of, out of high school, actually, he told me on a very chilly, very snowy December evening that he would be joining the army. And this is at a time when things weren't exceptionally peaceful in Iraq and in Afghanistan and Fallujah and all those places that have had such calamity and chaos in their lands. And I selfishly got mad at him. I was hurt because he was leaving me. It's one of my best friends telling me that I'm going to be gone. I'm leaving. I don't know when I'm going to be back. I know when I'm scheduled to be back. But I don't know if I'm coming back. And even that thought now just hits me as I reflect on it even in front of you now. And I thought... Just all these emotions going through my mind and thinking, 
What if he doesn't come back? And I was so, so mad. And of course, as life teaches us over and over, as we live on this earth longer and we look back at things, we see it in a different light, we see it in a different way. Short story is, he came back, he's fine. Hallelujah, praise God. Two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, he's safe at home with his wife. But it wasn't until later that I thought about it. And I found out after quite a while that the reason he enlisted into the army, the reason he went away to go to such a dangerous part of our world wasn't to hurt me, wasn't to make me angry or hurt his family or to scare anyone. So he told me that he had a son I didn't know about who lived in another state and that by him enlisting in the army his son would get those benefits that come with having a parent who's in our nation's service. That his son's quality of life would improve because of his sacrifice. Even if he didn't come back his son would keep those as long as he was alive. I just started thinking about that over and over and over. What, what a noble, unselfish thing that is. That he loved his family and he loved his country more than he valued his safety and his well-being. What an example of love. What an example. Like I said, the idea of sacrifice is something that we, we all relate to. We can understand what that means. Even if we haven't necessarily gone that far in showing that we know what it means, it still speaks to us. But it also got me thinking, why does it hurt so bad when someone that we love is removed from us? And it's, it's two things. It's because we love them and we have that attachment to them. And also, the nature of separation is hurt. The natural consequence of sin is separation from God. How do we deal with that? How is that taken care of? The answer, of course, is the crucifixion. God sending a bridge be to, to fill in the gap between God and humanity. And that bridge is Jesus Christ and the cross that he carried on his back, the cross that he was nailed to. A lot of times I feel like Good Friday is, it doesn't seem that good. Because we have to sit and think and, and, and reflect back on the abuse and the torture and the, and the awful things that, that Jesus went through. And to me, it makes me think about my sin and the significance of it. And me thinking about it, that's good. We should be sensitive to those things. We should be sensitive to sin. We serve a holy, righteous, just God who can have no sin in his presence. And I feel like more often than not, if we were to look at our sin, we try to minimize it. We say, oh, it's not that bad. Or no, it was, it was a one-time thing. It was a mistake. I'm never going to do that again. 
oh, I just thought about it. I did it again. And we try to cast a different light on it. We try to hide it. We try to sweep it under the rug. We try to do anything we can so that we don't understand or choose to acknowledge the significance of it. And it's only when it's held up next to Christ crucified that the reality, the weight, the significance of our sin is put into stark, shocking contrast. Because that is the wage of sin, is death. Jesus took that upon himself, willingly. As James noted, the Last Supper was Jesus and his disciples celebrating the Passover meal. The triumphal entry was about Jesus coming into Jerusalem to celebrate that Passover. In John's account of the gospel, we learned that the Pharisees wanted to remove Jesus, to get him out of the way, to kill him before the Passover meal was taken and that tradition was observed. By John's account, we know that Jesus arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover meal happened. Through biblical scholars, through historians, through the Jewish historian Josephus, we've learned that according to Jewish tradition, the lambs that were traditionally used as the atoning sacrifice for their sin was offered at the temple at three o'clock. If we look at how that timing worked out in God's perfect timing, orchestrating things exactly as they needed to be every step of the way, learn that Jesus, who was being tortured and brutalized and hung on a cross, died within the hour of when the sacrificial lambs were being slaughtered at the temple. Because like I said, the Romans thought they were performing an execution. What was really happening was the ultimate offering to God. The perfect offering. Because Jesus was a perfect man. No sin in his, in his body, no sin in his life, no sin in his thoughts. Offered on the cross being poured out as a drink offering for a punishment that we rightfully deserve. And again, it's only when you put things into that perspective that you see the significance of our own sin compared to what is happening to Jesus. In the gospel accounts, it talks about a number of things happening when the crucifixion had completed. It talked about the earth shaking but more significantly, and I think this is unfortunate that this piece is sometimes just glossed over, but the, the veil being torn. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of metaphor that happened in, in that sentence. Just like there's so much packed into that sentence. The veil being torn. In Old Testament times, when David was king, he, he was the one who built up the temple. It used to be just a tabernacle that traveled along with the Israelites. But there was a place in the temple that this veil cut off from everyone else. It was called the Holy of Holies. And only the chief priest could enter it and only once a year. You see, there's always been separation in humanity. There's always been God and us. And his desire is to bring those two together. And so when you read the veil being torn, it's not like a curtain you pull back on a sunny day. It's not like a bride's veil that you can see through. It's 60 feet tall. It's 30 feet wide and almost six inches thick. It's not a veil, it's a wall. Christ's death 
divided that wall, opening it, the access from us to God. Freely, anybody can have that now. It's not a place that just the chief priest can go into once a year. We can talk to God right now. And that is good. Good Friday is an opportunity for us, like the Israelites in the Passover, to reflect on God's salvation, his plan of salvation for us, and the accomplishment that Jesus led through the crucifixion. So how are we to remember that? How are we to live that out? John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. It's my hope and prayer that we would remember the crucifixion, what it means in our lives, in this church, in this community, and into the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for the life he led. We thank you so much for the love that he shared with us, God, while he was alive. And God, we thank you for the love that he shared with us when it came to the end of his earthly life. God, we're so humbled and grateful for this opportunity to come, God, together as your people in your house to celebrate and reflect of this time of infinite significance. God, thank you for changing history for us. We might know you as Lord and Savior. God, thank you for showing us love through the color red. In Jesus' name.